So welcome again to everybody to the Princeton 2022, Princeton Initiative 2022. So what I want to do today, and I would like to go into some basic models with heterogeneous agents, a real model, and then late in the afternoon we'll see some uh, nominal model, where there's also some price level and some monetary aspects uh, kicking in. But for the beginning, I would just wanted to two sector models, heterogeneous are two groups, and there are some financial frictions across them. But before I do this, I would like to go a bit, little bit back in history, given that we have so many uh, potential uh, historians uh, here in the audience, and just give you a brief history of economic thoughts in macrofinance. And the first thing I would like to do is uh, tell you about the, the connection between uh, macro and, and, and finance uh, historically. So if you go back to the to the old giants in, in the field, like Keynes, uh, Ivan Fisher, and Hayek, and all that. For them, finance and macro was very much integrated. There were not two fields. But then after the Second World War, essentially, it grew into two separate fields when it became more formalized. On the one hand, you have uh, macro focusing very much on the dynamic aspects, and finance focusing more on the static but the stochastic elements. So macro was focusing more on the deterministic dynamic aspects, like the growth theory, for example. I've depicted here a phase diagram. Uh, you can see here uh, a phase diagram. While you know, here I have a portfolio choice, so the, the efficient frontier, a Markowitz uh, portfolio choice problem, which was static but stochastic. So the emphasis was different. One is saying more the dynamics over time, because you want to know how economies grow. The other thing was focusing much more on the stochastic elements. And then around, you know, I would say in the 1970s, it was the case that the macro was field was then also introducing very much stochastic elements to that. And that also was done always in discrete time. So somebody likes the continuous time, but he is discrete. Who was that? Oh, you. Uh, so essentially, it was done primarily in discrete time, like Brock Merman's, Doki Lucas book you're all familiar with, and also the DSGE models. It was essentially in uh, a discrete time. Finance in the 70s or late 60s, in the last century, also moved into broad stochastic element, then also in, in a dynamic version, but they moved immediately in continuous time. And so the most classic example is option pricing, like Black-Scholes formula. Okay, that's essentially the Prodito calculus into the economic field or in the finance field. And then there's, of course, option pricing with Black-Scholes. Then you have Cox, Ingersoll, Ross with the term structure models, a lot of term structure models, how to understand the interest rate yield curve. And then Yuli also worked a lot on, on agency theory in continuous time. And what we want to do is we want to bring this together. We want to bring essentially two fields together again, macro and finance and also monetary. And we do this also in continuous time because we think there's some huge advantages in using continuous time methods. Okay. Of course, there might be also some drawbacks, and you have to be aware of these drawbacks as well. And that's essentially what we are uh, also alerting to, what are the, the drawbacks as well. But in general, you can solve things much more analytically, much deeper, and go to the computer at a later stage. And hence, you can also run things more quickly on the computer. You can estimate it more easily. So there are big advantages for being able to solve many steps analytically, and then go to the computer at a later stage. But the challenge is always what you try to solve analytically, how to assume certain things, and then you know when do you go into computer, and we will see that. But in general, that's you know where I see the two fields coming together again, and we do this now already for several years uh, to you know uh, bring these uh, two fields together closer. So what uh, one distinction also, if you look at monetary models, I would like to emphasize is that. Um, in many macro models, in a lot of these monetary models, the main decision is essentially controlling aggregate the consumption demand. Okay, so it's like a demand management. It could be at the zero lower bound, but the consumption, the aggregate consumption in the economy is the driving factor. So it's all about the Euler equation with respect to consumption. And the risk component, the, you know, the risk premia and these aspects, they're not at the forefront What's really at the forefront is the aggregate consumption process. And if you want to do you know, yield curve or something like this, typically you use expectations hypothesis or uncovered interest rate parity, things like that. You just assume and the risk premium is really not at the center of things. 
And uh, more recently, of course, this changed, and that's also bring more heterogeneity. What we want to do in macro finance, we also want to bring the portfolio decisions into play, okay, where people decide what portfolio to choose, and that's essentially a more challenging thing. You have a consumption choice and a portfolio choice. Uh, you have essentially uh, not you have the risk free rate, but you also have risk premium floating around. And it's not a fixed risk premium, it's moving over time. Okay? And that's essentially what we want to do. And what's happening is that you have exogenous risk. So typically so the, the risk is this shock from outside shocks, and then there's endogenous risk that comes through amplification. And we want to model the amplification endogenously. And the total risk is, has two components, the exogenous risk plus the endogenous risk. And then you multiply the sum of the two with the price of risk, and the price of risk is moving around as well. So if you go in a crisis, essentially price of risk is going up a lot, endogenous risk is going up a lot, and the risk premium is going up a lot as well. And we want to understand all of these interactions and how it moves over the cycle. Okay, that's essentially uh, the, the, the key. And financial frictions play a critical role, and if you want to understand financial frictions, you need you know, some trading, a borrower and a lender, and you can't have a repressive agent analysis. Okay? You need heterogeneity. If there is no friction, aggregation theorems kick in and you can have a repressive agent represent, uh, model and that captures everything. But if you want to understand financial frictions, then you need heterogeneity, serious heterogeneity, and that's why we focus very much on a heterogeneous model often with two sectors or then within the sector there's also heterogeneity and it's very important to have this heterogeneity to understand financial frictions. And if you want to do monetary, we would argue that for monetary economics financial frictions are very important as well. So it's not only price stickiness, it's the financial frictions which uh, really drive things, which give meaning to money and also, you know, as a safe asset and also changes over the cycle. There's flight to safety in times of crisis. That changes, of course, the inflation pressure or deflation pressure, and all of this uh, plays into the, into the whole thing. And all of this is, uh, is done in, in models. So, and our philosophy is a little bit, we want to have elegant models which you can solve to a large extent analytically and then go to the computer. Um, and it might be, to some extent, more simplified models, but you understand what's going on in the model and at some point you might want to put 35 effects into the model and then go to the computer and, and calibrate things. And we would also do some calibration. So Sebastian will do some calibration uh, later in the afternoon. But the philosophy is also to really understand the model. And our, so our experience, at least with my experience also working with Yuli, is that you essentially go in a conversation with a model. So you develop, you set up a model, and the model throws something at you and you don't understand it. And then you talk to the model and then you understand it deeper. And then you go talk further, try to play with the model. And you constantly go back and forth and you understand things deeper as you play with the models. Okay? And that's, that's essentially what uh, we're trying to achieve. So as I said, there's heterogeneity and there are many models in the profession out there. The heterogeneity could be, you know, some people are poor now and rich later, while others are rich now and poor later, and so you do borrowing and lending. Some people are more productive than others, hence the productive borrow from the less productive ones. There might be a difference in patience, there might be a difference in risk aversion, or there might be a difference in beliefs. So somebody said he wants to work on behavioral uh, elements, so there might be heterogeneous prior beliefs. Uh, that's also another way that people speculate this way. And in all of these, if you have financial frictions on top of it, then what matters is the wealth distribution and the dynamics of the wealth distribution. How is wealth evolving over time? And that's what we try to understand. And that's where the continuous time comes in very nicely because you get nice uh, descriptions of the evolution of the wealth shares. Okay? And that's what will be the focus. How is the wealth share and the economy moving over time? And that's what you need in the settings. And then we put, later on, we will put a financial sector on top of it, so there are all these frictions, and the role of the financial sector is actually to reduce these financial frictions. So you put the financial sector into the model, it helps to reduce the financial frictions, uh, 
but sometimes the financial sector doesn't work well, so the financial frictions, frictions pop up again, okay? and that creates cycles. Okay? So the financial sector's role is essentially to overcome some of these financial frictions. So what are these financial frictions? So here is just uh, some of them. Uh, so one is, of course, you might have just some belief distortions, but the mostly what we will do in this class or in this event now is incubate markets. Okay, so certain markets you can't trade. So here's a picture. So this is just two states of the world, state one and state two. You can have payoffs, but you know you cannot trade all. In this case, where there are only two states of the world, two area the pro securities would complete the market, but you can only trade the bond. Okay, so that's that's what you can uh, trade here along this line. So you can only trade it pays off one dollar in each state of the world. It's not risky payoff. That's one example. You can only borrow, you cannot really issue some risky securities or other securities. And that's what we will do a lot. And there will be a natural leverage constraint. And we will see that you know, people want to borrow, but not too much, because then suddenly risk aversion kicks in, and then they get too concerned. If you go on Benankler Gertler Grillkrichts, why is there this bond? Uh, you can some costly state verification a la Townsend, Rob Townsend's framework gives you the rationale why you can only trade the bond or why you can only issue debt contracts. And there are many, there's a whole corporate finance literature why you can only have a debt contracts. So that's the uh, incubate markets friction. On top of it, you can have some uh, debt limits, how much debt you can issue. And this could be an exogenous limit. And in the Bewley type models or in Ayagari type models, you have these exogenous limits. Okay? You can just, just by assumption, you cannot borrow more than that. Okay? In, in Crusell Smith, for example, uh, it's, it's, you cannot borrow at all, but you can just have some exogenous limit there. How much you can borrow might also depend on your assets, on the value of your assets, and then it's a collateral constraint. So it's, it's less exogenous, so you can borrow if, if your assets are more worth more, then you can borrow more. If the assets are worth less, you can borrow less. And that's essentially, uh, you know, Kiyotaki Moore, for example, assumed this uh, a borrowing constraint or collateral constraint, which depends on the assets. So how much you can borrow this B depends on the number of machines you have times uh, the value of the machines in the next period. So it's discrete times so in the next period, how much will the value be of your machines? And that, that you know, and you have to pay back. So this is one plus little r. So that has to be uh, smaller than this thing. So it's a, it, once the shock occurred in Kiyotaki Moore, of course, it's deterministic. So you know perfectly what the value of the machines will be next period. And that's how much you can borrow. Okay, that's uh, some collateral constraint. Now, of course, it could be that you have a really stochastic model. We will deal with a lot with stochastic models. Uh, then you, how much you can borrow depends very much on, let's say, a value at risk constraint. Okay, so there's a distribution of potential prices next period for the value of your machines, some physical capital, let's say, or could be also some financial claims. And you can only borrow, uh, you know, up to the 5% quantile. Okay. And that's, uh, that would be a value at risk constraint. You can also, if John Chenacoplos has, you can borrow up to the worst price realization in the next period. And then there's some models where you just instead, because the tomorrow's price is very hard to solve, you just pick the current price. It's a shortcut. Okay? So how much you can borrow depends on today's price rather than the price uh, when you have to pay back. And then there's some other models with search frictions. Uh, you know, Jonathan Payne will present something on digital money on Sunday. And I, I noticed that there are several people working or thinking about CBDC and other digital money elements. Uh, then the, the search frictions are coming to play. Okay. And uh, so that's essentially where the different frictions come. And I will, we will emphasize very much the income markets. Of course, there will be some endogenous uh, natural, natural leverage constraint. Uh, but later we can add, you can always add more and more constraints. Okay, let's let's start with the simplest one. There's only one constraint. Essentially, you can only issue, let's say, debt. Later we will allow the experts who are more productive, let's say, or um, you know, they want to borrow. They can also issue some equity claims, but only to a certain extent because there's some skin in the game constraint. Okay, because for moral hazard reasons, they cannot issue a lot. You see already contracting issues come into play here. And as I said, uh, this slide actually 
I can skip. So let me. So what the earlier literature in macrofinance uh, did. So that started, you know, with Bernanke Gertler in the 80s, and then Kiyotaki Moore, Bernanke Gertler Gilchrist, and all this a huge literature on that. It was essentially documenting and also modeling how can a single shock lead to a persistent depression of the economy. That's if you think about after the global financial crisis, it was a shock, and it took you know many many years to get out of that. And that was one of the focus. And the idea was essentially to look at uh, net worth, so the net worth of the wealth of the entity of the sector which has to borrow matters a lot. So you have a, a negative shock on net worth, and that means you have to scale back uh, what you can do. The productivity is going down, so your profit is also going down, so next period's net worth will also be depressed. And that drags on into the future. So you have a shock, a negative shock leads to declining net worth. You have to scale back, so your profits are going down. And it takes a long while to rebuild your net worth. Okay? And this is typically in this type of models. It's you have a zero probability shock, often referred to as MIT shock, totally unanticipated, out of the blue. And, and then it depresses you, and then it slowly you build up and go back. So that's this persistence result. That's one of the, the, the big things. But uh, of course, there's more to it. And what then Kiyotaki Moore put to, to the picture, and also in BGG, Bernanke Gertler Gilchrist, that's also there, but it's nicely worked out on Kiyotaki Moore, is that there is also an amplification. There's a lot of static amplification, which you know, comes earlier from these fire cell models, where in finance in particular, there are static models were you know, they have a shock, um, there's fire cell that depresses the productive sector, the, and then the assets have to be sold at a fire cell price to the less productive sector, that depresses the whole thing, and that leads to some uh, liquidity spirals, and the market liquidity is low. What Kiyotaki Moore did, they put this in this persistent framework in a dynamic setting, uh, and essentially said, okay, there's actually two channels. There's one, there's this persistence, as you know, in Bernanke Gürtel in 1989, I think. And then there's also this dynamic amplification on top of the static amplifications, which is in a lot of uh, finance papers. So well, how does this work? So we had already this gray shock here. That depresses the net worth. And then, you know, it slowly only builds up. But if net worth is depressed and future profits are depressed, that means the future profits will be depressed. It also means asset prices will be depressed too. Okay. And asset prices, so this is a forward equation. It goes forward. Uh, this is a forward moving equation. And then asset prices are going backwards, a backward equation from the future back to the, so but if you have a collateral constraint, actually it all feeds back as well. And then your collateral constraint is even more binding. Hence, uh, you have to cut back your production even further this period. Okay, do you see that there's one, the persistence, you have a negative shock, the negative shock uh, kills some of the net worth, uh, then because of the net worth is depressed, you cannot produce so much today, you have less profit, uh, even next period you have lower net worth, you produce less, so the shock, which even though it's a one-time shock, it persists over time, but once your constraint depends on asset prices, the asset price will reflect that your production is depressed over time, it will feed back and makes the current constraint even more binding, okay? Because it's from the future going back, so asset prices are backward looking, uh, like value function, asset prices, they're always from the future going to the, to the present. And that depresses essentially, it makes the constraint even more binding, and that amplifies, that's this dynamic amplification, okay? Now the critique uh, of this uh, work, and this is very insightful work, is that this is a one-time MIT shock, and then from when the shock is over, uh, it's deterministic. We know exactly how long the recession will last. There's no asset price moving around anymore. It's, it's deterministic. So this is the single shock critique that this happens. Uh, there's one MIT shock, and then the length of the slump is deterministic. Uh, there's no element of volatility afterwards. While in the real world, when you go in a recession, a recession is typically characterized by having a lot of uncertainty. We don't know how long the recession will last. We don't know how severe it will be, make it even worse. And all of these things uh, is, is switched off in this type of models. 
And what we want to do and what I want to introduce to you are some toolkit how to have a model where you have some volatility dynamics. Okay, so it's not only uh, there's a one-time shock and then the deterministic go back, the volatility itself is moving around. So that's this endogenous risk I was talking about, how's the time variation of the volatility and secondly, uh, the price of risk is moving around too. You know? Because if the volatility moves around, the price of risk moves around. And all of this e endogenously. Okay? It should, the actually shock structure is non-time varying. But the, the whole thing through the endogenous system, things become time varying endogenously. So that's essentially what I'm after. By the way, you can ask questions. No, it's very quiet here. <laughs> So that's essentially uh, what we want to do. Uh, <coughs> and it has implication on the consumption choice and the portfolio choice. Okay, so the consumption choice is that, oh, once your volatility goes up, you also change your consumption savings pattern because you have more precautionary savings kicking in. You go in a recession, suddenly you say, oh my God, I have to save more because there's so much volatility out there. So volatility moves around, so the savings, precautionary savings is moving around. That gives you the role of money uh, you want to save in money or in a safe asset. And on top of it, uh, you know, the volatility itself moves around, it affects your portfolio choice, where you save into, okay, in the safe assets or the more risky assets. And that's the two choices that always come into play, not only the consumption, but also the portfolio choice is very, very important. Okay. And then it, there's often what we talk of volatility paradox, where you know, there's, even if the exogenous volatility is low, it could be uh, that actually the total volatility is high because of the behavior of the agents in the economy. Okay? And you get this low volatility periods where actually because of agents taking a lot of leverage and other risks, the endogenous volatility is actually kicking up and makes the whole thing more dramatic. Okay, so what we'll do a lot in, in the future, we will not work on this uh, simple uh, impulse response functions. We, we have a state variable, let's say call it eta, and this will be our state variable for many times. There will be characterized the drift of eta and with volatility of eta. And what you will see often is that, you know, the, the drift is like this blue uh, curve here. It's negative in this, so it moves back. Here, if it's positive, it moves to this. So it, this drastic steady state is here. So it moves up here and it moves down this way. And then the question is, how much does it, is how more volatile is it? That depends on this red. So it's very volatile down here. So it jumps around a lot. It doesn't jump so much, but it just slowly drifts back. And here it drifts up. And why does it drift up here? If this is a wealth share, it's because you know some people have to take some risk and they get a lot of risk premia. So the risk premia determine a lot who are, you know the wealth shares drift around because who earns the risk premium and who has to pay for the risk premium it depends a lot how wealth shares move around. Okay. <coughs> okay. So with this opening, I will jump into the first model. Okay. So are there questions uh, at this stage? So what I will do is I will, I, so I tell you a little bit what the outline is. So you, as I said, or I didn't mention yet, I teach a class here at Princeton, which is also open to others if you want to attend it, uh, which goes in all the nitty gritty details how to solve this type of models. Uh, and here I just give you a little bit of a flavor. Uh, and some of you have taken already the first two classes. So you, you will, so the course will actually go much more in deep depth and say, okay, here have a hands on how I, now I know how to solve the models. I know how to do the numerical steps at the end. And then you can just run with it and do your own thing. And you can apply this to, to real models. And that's what we'll do today a little bit. Uh, you can, of course, introduce jumps as well. I will not go into this uh, in the initiative. And then you apply, I think what's very exciting, you apply it also to, uh, to money models, to nominal models. Yeah. where the value of money comes really from uh, you know, incubate markets, financial frictions, and not from price stickiness. You of course can put price stickiness on top of it. And then you can also put it as, if you have heterogeneous agents, you have two sectors, you put a flag in each sector and suddenly it becomes an international model. Okay? <laughs> and <laughs> um, so you can also have put this in international macrofinance models. Okay? So there's, 
let's say, the money, which is the currency in one country, there's another currency, the currencies are competing with each other, and the currencies are imperfect substitutes because you have heterogeneous risk profiles. Okay? And you have to deal with these risk profiles, and these tools allow you to deal with that. Okay? And if you think about it, often what we have in a lot of models <coughs> And deterministic models, the two monies are too similar to each other. So the one with the higher interest rate, higher real return is just dominating the other one or do it indifferent. But if they are heterogeneous risk profiles, then you have a much broader picture you can do in this. And <coughs> if you think about if you have competing currencies, then it can also go to digital money very quickly. You know? Because these are also two competing currencies, uh, digital private stable coin. <coughs> competing with CBDCs, for example. So you get into this too. It's not two sectors with a, a flag in it in each sector. It's essentially you might be in one country, but there are some other differences and you can have digital money in that. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the outline of the course. If you want to take it, just send me an email and you can be part of it. Um, but today I just give you the, the, the flavor. Okay, uh, and so what I will do is I will start with this Basa Coco model. Uh, which is uh, the simplest, and I will, I'll do it because it's so simple, and then I will say, look, it has a lot of shortcomings. And then I will say, okay, we have to enrich it, because all what I told you now, this risk dynamics and all these things, is not really a popping up. It only pops out if you, once we enrich the model. Okay. But we always start simple, and then we build on it. Okay. So here is, here is the model. There are two sectors. There is an export sector and there's a household sector. And the export sector is more productive, or in this case, actually, the export sector is the only one who can produce something. Okay? The household sector cannot produce anything. And the export sector has some capital. Capital K is the amount of capital. Think of the number of machines or trees in the economy. And Q, well, often we use QK, is the price of a single machine. Okay, so the total value of all this capital is Q times K. And of course, these experts, they have a lot of they have production technology, but they don't have all the wealth in the economy. So they have some net worth N, that's down here, that's the equity, but they have to, in order to scale up, they lever up, they issue some debt claims. Okay? And, and who buys these debt claims, these are the households. The households cannot operate any machines in this example. Uh, they only hold these debt claims. And they get the interest payments, of course, from the expert sector. And the total wealth in the economy is, is the total value of the capital. And the net worth is what, what's owned by the, the value which is assigned to the experts. And the rest of it, the total value of the capital minus the net worth of the experts, that's the net worth of these households. Okay? Now we can think of terms of net worth, also wealth shares or net worth shares. Uh, then we have to just divide n by this thing here, okay? And so that's the economy, okay? It's very simple, no? but we start simple. So we, are, as I said, we are in this example. So what's the friction? So I forgot to mention, the friction is these experts can only sell debt claims, okay? That's the friction. So we're in this incubate market setting. They can only sell uh, debt, risk-free debt. They cannot sell equity claims. Right, so this, this, this capital, so I should say, this capital is risky and they cannot offload this risk at all. Okay? And they can also not sell these machines to the households because the households don't know what to do with these machines. They can't operate it. So the only thing, the simplest thing, later you can sell the machines to the households, you can issue some equity claims and all this, but for now, nothing like that. The only thing they can do is sell some debt claims. Okay, so here let's be a little bit more formal. So the output is this superscript E are the experts, so that's, and there's a continuum of experts, so each expert has uh, a number of machines, little KE, and the productivity is A, and the output rate uh, is YE, okay? And the consumption rate for the experts is CE, just notation, for the households is CH. And then there's an investment rate. So the experts can say, I will build new machines, or I plant, if you think of Lucas trees or something, I take an apple, let's say the output is an apple, and the capital stock is trees, I take an apple and plant an apple in the, tree, in the ground, and then I get uh, more trees. Okay? So how does this work? 
this works uh, the following, that the change in the capital stock for this particular uh, guy, I, I uh, is how many, that's investment rate, so that's the existing capital, what's it, at what rate does he plant trees, and that's how many trees do you get depends on this concave phi function, okay? So remember this, in most uh, Newcanesian models you use this uh, phi function, that's like the adjustment cost function. Okay, it's not, initially when you plant trees, almost every apple turns into a tree, but when you plant thousands of apples, not every apple turns into a tree. No? That, there's some concavity there. And then there's a depreciation, so that's a negative drift, okay, because of the depreciation. If you plant more, it's a positive uh, drift. This minus delta is depreciation of this thing. It's proportional, so it's a change in total, so it's a percentage change, okay? And what's a shock? The shock is, the shock is to the capital stock. Some, there's a wind coming, a hurricane or something, some of the apple trees fall down okay, and break, or not, not productive. You can measure this in terms of number of machines. You can also, oh, it's measured in productivity units, okay, if you, if you don't like that. The wind is, to, is destroying some machines. You can also think of productivity units. And, um, okay, so that's, uh, that's essentially it. And then they have preferences. Uh, so they have constant relative risk aversion preferences with a risk aversion coefficient of gamma. And um, then, you know, there's a time preference rate of rho. Okay, that's how they discount the utility. Uh, often we will use, what I will use today in the initiative, we all only lo uh, look at the utility, uh, log utilities. Okay. And that's the same for the households as well. They have the same preferences. Later, we'll actually make them different in patients as well. But for now, let's keep them the same preferences. So how do that differ? They're heterogeneity. These guys, they're, they're not productive. They don't, can't do anything with the capital. They can't even hold it. Um, and they consume, of course, different things. They can't invest because they can't hold this capital. So it's essentially the same. And the friction is, as I mentioned, these guys can only issue some risk-free debt. They would love to get rid of some of this. This, this is a Brownian motion. Uh, they would like to get rid of this uh, Brownian motion risk, okay? offload it by selling some equity claims. Okay? Now, let me jump over that. So what we do, and that's also these lecture notes I send you, uh, essentially is that you can solve this type of models by a step-by-step -step approach. So over the years, we developed a step-by-step -step approach uh, where you can solve all of these models in this four or five steps, okay? And then there are sub-steps as, as well. Uh, and you have to work through the lecture notes or to attend this course in order to see all the steps. But that's how you can solve all of these models. It took us a lot of time to really think about it. But essentially, there are three blocks the first is a finance block. Uh, you say for a given consumption wealth ratio, so a process of consumption wealth ratio, if you have an endowment economy, that's just the aggregate consumption wealth ratio, if you an aggregate endowment economy. <coughs> and then you get from that, you get also some SDF, stochastic discount factor process, and that's your, what you take as exogenous, or you postulate this and take it for, as given for now, and then you solve the finance block, okay? What's the investment rate? you impose some goods market clearing condition, and then we will often use this Martingale approach. And typically in economics, you use a, an HJB approach, the Bellman equation approach. You can use this too. There are three ways to do that. You can use the Bellman equation approach. You can use the max, uh, stochastic maximum principle approach, Pontryagin approach, and or you can use, which is a subset of that, is, is the Martingale method. In finance, you use a lot of the Martingale method. And if you want to know that, you read or you attend the class. Uh, I will just show you the theorem and how we apply it. And it's, it's the most attractive and uh, most simple way to do things. So that's, that's the finance approach or the finance block. And then you have some forward equations. And if you watched Yuli's videos, you know, there's something you go from the past forward. So, and wealth moves from the past. So you're so wealthy, you consume out of that. You make some profits. That's how wealth is moving forward. 
okay, moves from the past to the present. And then there's some other, then you have some backward equation. That's how it, the future moves from, from the future, like asset pricing equations. It's about future dividends, future payoffs going backwards to the present. So the, the wealth shares, they move forward and asset prices move backwards from the future to the present. And we have to bring everything to the present and how we optimize today. So we have some forward equations and we have some backwards equations. Okay. And that's uh, and the value function. So asset prices, value functions, these are all backwards equations. Okay, so that's and what we will do today is we just assume log utility, and with log utility you will see everything is uh, you can ignore the future to some extent. Uh, that makes the whole thing simple, so you don't have to do this value function iteration and elements like that. And and then you know you solve this, you go numerically, and if you want to derive from this mean the drift, how the drift moves and the volatility, the stationary distribution, you can use the Kolmogorov forward equation, and you just have learned from Andre that he's very proud that his first name is uh, coincide with uh, Kolmogorov's uh, first name. Uh, Good. So that's essentially these are the steps, and I, I just cancelled a lot of things. You know, if you have no money, then there's no money relation equation, things like that. Uh, and so I will not go into details. That I just want to give you a flavor how you do this. But there is a manual. It's a little bit like what you do in traditional uh, models, where saying, "Oh, solve the planners problem, then to decentralize, and things like that." With frictions, it works differently. No? You have to follow a different menu, a different step-by-step -step approach. This is the step-by-step -step approach you can uh, use for that. Now, what you do, the first step, and that's step zero, you postulate a lot of things. Okay, so we know that, or I should have said, the, the capital stock, how does it change? It, of course, depends how much the investment rate and the depreciation and the shock here. And they can also buy, a single guy can also buy some of this, some trees or machines from somebody else. That's this D delta. Okay? Of course, in aggregate, they cannot buy. As if somebody buys, somebody else has to sell. Uh, but that's also for individually is going on. So once we aggregate it up, then we can aggregate everything up. So that's just some notation. Within the sector, we can aggregate it up. Across sectors, it's just without a superscript. And the capital share, we denote by a kappa. And you can do the same thing for the net worth. The net worth share, we call by call eta. Okay? So the, the individual net worth of a single guy integrated within the sector becomes capital NI over the sectors. So we have a finite number of sectors or countries with a flag. Uh, and then you, you say the wealth share or the net worth share is eta. The value of the capital stock is, as I said, Q times K. And we also postulate, so this we know, that this process. I mean, we don't know what these guys are doing and what this investment rate is, but they know the process. And then we postulate a process for the price of the machines. Okay? I don't know what it is, but I can just say it follows an E2 process. Okay. It has a certain drift. So the percentage change of the price it follows a certain drift and a certain volatility loading on this aggregate Brownian. So in this model, there's only one Brownian process which characterizes the whole probability space. Okay. And this one Brownian, there's a Brownian process which everything is shocked from this Brownian. And different other processes live in this probability space, so they load on this Brownian. And how much they load on it depends on this uh, sigma. Okay? And there's the price also loads on this Brownian. If some, let me give you an example, suddenly there's a hurricane, a lot of trees are destroyed. Let's say the value of the machines go up or the value of the trees go up. That means whenever there's a hurricane, so that's my hurricane Brownian, uh, uh, so K goes down and and so sigma would, Q goes up. So this sigma would have an opposite sign from this sigma, okay? Because it goes in the opposite direction. But it's, the probability space is given by this one Brownian. That governs my whole uncertainty, okay? And if you think about a Brownian, the way you should think about it is a binomial tree where it goes up and down, up and down all the time. Um, and we just, 
do this you know, not every period, but every half period, every quarter period. So we make the period smaller and smaller and all the step size smaller and smaller. And it takes a limit and you get from this random walk, you get the Brownian representation. And what we typically use is this geometric formulation where everything is in percentage terms. So a standard Brownian, you would not divide by Q here, but we, we take it in, in, in terms of changes per Q units. So, so which one, why do we want to write what uh, in this guy? The first one, the first line. I think that's a question I had in your data say back the yes. paper. So I'm just thinking the reason why we don't write it in the first strip term is it because you want, we want this to go to zero in aggregation. Did, did this, this term at the end? Yeah. Yeah, so this in aggregation, so, this, so we don't, we can actually drop this. So later we will express everything in returns. And in returns, if you buy or sell a machine at a fair price, you don't improve or worsen the returns. That's why if, if everything is expressed in the returns, so this is the value of the stock, and then you say, oh, how does the value of the stock change? Uh, this buying and selling at the fair price does not change your returns. That's why we can ignore it um, later on. So we can, but strictly speaking, it's there. But in the aggregate economy, it, it, it washes out and it doesn't affect returns. And when you make your portfolio choice, what, what guides your portfolio choice is the relative returns to each other. That, good point. Okay, so a little bit of uh, basics of E2 calculus, and I think Yuli will go much more in details. And that I just want to s uh, give you a few rules. Uh, one is Ito's lemma, and oh. Sorry, just a question about the last slide. Um, to what extent is the price process a postulate? Or so do you know that given that law of motion in equilibrium it will end up being an ETO process? Or yeah, so here I make a, a little bit of an assumption. Uh, so I say the the price process follows an ETO process, and I say it has a drift and a volatility, but I don't know this yet. No. I just postulate it. It's like this method of undetermined coefficients and similar to that. And then I, I'm, I work with it and manipulate it. And at the end, I have to close the model. And then I get essentially a solution for this thing. So these things will be functions of the state variable in the economy, because they're time varying as the state variable moves around. But I don't know them yet, but I can postulate them and work as if I would know them, manipulate the whole thing. And at the end, I close it. And the, the key in these models is always, or in any model, is what do I postulate, what do I work with, and what do I then manipulate first, and then what do I solve at the end? You know, that's always what you have. And here I just postulate these things. Um, now, I forgot to mention, I postulate more, not only this price process, I also postulate uh, uh, an SDF process. Okay? So that's my SDF process. Uh, C is our stochastic discount factor. That's the marginal utility. So I postulate the marginal utility for each of the agents. What matters is I have only two types of agents. So I have two of these processes. And then there's a drift. And then there's a volatility loading. So the probability space is given by this one Brownian. So I have a drift. And I have how much does this SDF process load on this Brownian you know, spanning the probability space, OK? And the, of course, there can be different. So the SDF of the experts can be different from the SDF of the households. Of course, if they can trade bonds, they have to have the same. Oh, sorry, I should have said the drift. There's a DT missing, by the way, sorry. Um, the drift is minus the risk-free rate, OK? And given that the debt can be traded at the risk-free rate, it has to be coinciding because for the experts on the households. And the loading on the Brownian minus that, that's a price of risk. Okay. So you can show this, we will show this later with the Martical uh, method, that the drift is the risk minus the risk free rate, and uh, the loading on the Brownian is, is a price of risk, the okay. price of this Brownian risk for this agent I. Okay. 
So we postulate this. Essentially, we have to postulate for two of them, one for each type of agent. Okay. And then we work with it. And at the end, we close the model. Okay. Is this the unique solution to the model? Or is this one solution that's not the most unique? So, so this actually, I, I don't, so there are the two questions in your question. So by postulating that, I might get actually, at the end, I might get two solutions, two Q, like mu Qs, and, or two sigma Qs. So I don't say that this has to be a unique one. I say this is, uh, I can then s manipulate this and work with it. At the end, I get two solutions, and then I have, say, I have two equilibria or, you know, of the whole thing. Uh, what I see, and that's, uh, who asked there about it? What I did not allow for are chumps, okay? I said, oh, there's no, the probability space doesn't open any chumps, but you could have a setting where you have no exogenous risk at all, but then suddenly there are chumps. If we have models with bank runs, okay? There's no exogenous risk. If you think about diamond dipping or something, there's no exogenous risk, it's just a belief jump, and then you have a jump. So this I have ruled out. Now, you have to take the class in order to, then what you have to do is a plus some dj for jumps. You know? But I don't want to go into this today. Okay. Uh, so by assuming this, that the price has to follow an ETO process, I ruled out jumps in, in the price. And even though the economy, there's no fundamental exogenous jump, the only exogenous risk is that one, the endogenous layer jump risk might occur. Okay. But that's chapter four of the lecture notes, so we won't get there today. Um, Can you help me understand what you call the loading on the ground on of the SDF a price of risk? Why is it a price? Uh, I'll do this in a little bit, but it's it's a, it's a good point. So, but do you understand why the the drift is the risk free rate? So it, it's a little bit in discrete time when you do the Euler equation for asset pricing. If, if you look at what's the, the price of a bond is the expected uh, SDF. No? Do you think if you, I don't know what you call SDF in discrete time is let's say capital M. So typically the price of an asset is the expected SDF, a product of SDF times uh, you know, the payoff of this asset. Okay? And if, if you have a bond, the payoff is always one dollar in each state of the world. So the price of the bond is just expected. Uh, so now I call, Everything is here expressed in terms of rates. So if, if I just say, what is the price of the bond? It's e to the power minus risk-free rate, okay? Is the expected e to the power. And that's essentially why you get, if there's no risk, the, the drift is just the risk-free rate. And you see, it's quite, it's quite elegant, no? You can just say. And why this, uh, I have to go for the Martinal theory. Uh, then uh, you see that, okay? Uh, in a little bit, but I will, jump a little bit uh, on this. For this, you have to pick up that. So here is uh, uh, some ETO, basic ETO calculus, and probably you, you know this all. But what I do is we mostly work with geometric ETO processes. So uh, arithmetic, typically of arithmetic ones, uh, where just it's like a binomial tree, where just plus delta minus delta plus delta minus delta. Here it's multiplicative. You know, that's the that's geometric one. So in other words, uh, this, this x is squeezed in. Or typically what I did here is I just divided by this x and then, or this q here, and it comes to the other side. I could also uh, divide this x and move it to the other side. Okay. Oh. So that's my geometric one. So Ito's lemma essentially says, <coughs> if I have a process x, x and I have a function on this process x, what is the process f of x, okay? And so it just says, okay, the process f of x is just f prime of x times the drift of x, which is this whole thing, because it's geometric. To the arithmetic one would be, is the whole thing here. So that's the drift of x. And then there's this famous Ito term, no? which is a half plus f double prime, uh, the volatility of x squared. Uh, this, this x appears again because this x is over there. Um, and that's, that's my eta term. So the drift has this extra eta term, so this dt. And then there's the volatility term of this f of x process, which is the volatility of x, like we have up there, t 
times f prime of things. Okay? Have you all seen, probably you've all seen the Ito's lemma. So that's one, so you can, for example, one example is if you want, um, you have the consumption process and you would like to have the SDF process. Mm -hmm. So the SDF process is just the margin utility. Okay? So my f of x is just u prime of x. So if you have this utility function, that's just c to the power minus gamma. Okay? That's my margin utility. So I have my consumption process. And then it gets, what is actually my stochastic discount factor process? Said, oh, for, for example, this the margin utility process is just minus gamma sigma square. Okay. So I have a consumption process with this volatility loading on the Brownian. What is the margin utility loading is just minus gamma multiplied with that. That's my STF process then. Now, but what's more important, what we'll use uh, all the time, is this uh, product rule where said I have a process x and have a process y, and I want to know when I, if I multiply them, what is actually uh, the process of this product. I have, for example, the stock price process in euros, and I have an exchange rate converting the euros into uh, dollars. So one is the stock price, the other one is the exchange rate. What is then the stock price in dollars? Okay, it's a product of the two. Okay, and so I have x times y, and then it's very simple. It's just the drift of x plus the drift of y plus the product of the two volatilities over there. Um, and that's, that's like a covariance term. Okay? If the exchange rate and the stock price co-move a lot, it shows up in this drift. Okay? That's like the covariance term here. Okay? And then the volatility of this product is just the sum of the two sigmas loading on this Brownian. Okay? So you see this very elegant formula, and so we will use these formulas all the time. And you have the E to ratio rule where x is divided by, by y. That could be, you know, if the exchange rate is the other way around, uh, then you have just the drift of x minus the drift of y plus the Z to term. Now it's the volatility of y and the difference between these two volatilities. And also the volatility of this process, of this ratio, is the volatility of x minus the volatility of y. Okay, that's just. So what we want to do in this economy, um, so typically in our economies, it's, it's, there's, there's just some, there's some, some assets here producing something, then some guys want to issue some debt, sometimes they might issue some outside equity, and the capital share in this example we are now looking at is 100% with the experts. Okay? The capital share is 100%. They hold the physical assets. They produce some output. Uh, some of this output can be consumed. Some of the apples of the output will be planted into new trees. This investment rate leads to more capital stock. And it also leads to this growth rate. So it's an AK economy. If the capital stock grows, the economy grows. Um, and so one decision is who holds the physical assets? That's the capital share. Who is producing with them? And the other decision is who is holding the risk associated with this production. So this, this is a, the capital allocation, and that's the risk allocation, this, this chi. Okay? That's if in our setting, they cannot issue any outside equity, so it's 100% held by the experts. Okay? Once they can issue some outside equity, then this, this is moving around too. And then that gives you a price of risk. Now what's the price of risk? That depends on the value function on the SDF you know, this March utility is, is, is a value function that determines the price of risk. And the price of risk, if the price of risk is high, then it means you get a risk premium. So the net worth, this drift, the wealth share of this expert is actually drifting upwards because they get the higher risk premium. That gives you some extra drift on the net worth. Okay. Now, of course, if they take a lot of risk, they also have a lot of volatility on their wealth share. Okay, that's coming from this, and it might be amplified, the risk. Okay. And if they consume a lot from the output, the net worth is going down. Okay. And of course, the net worth is also affecting, so this goes, this goes here and it goes in the back and comes back up here. Do you see it? And that's also you know, how the, the allocation happens. 
is, is also affected there. So, but essentially you have, these are all forward equations. So how you move things forward, how you know the, you get the price of risk, earn a risk premium, how this moves forward. The value function, that's a backward equation. So these blue things are backward equation and these gray things are forward equations, okay? Okay, so let's just do it. Um, so what are the decisions for each of these experts? They have to decide how much to invest, how many new trees to plant, how many, how, what portfolio do you hold? That's a theta. And what's the consumption rate? These are the three decisions each expert has to take. On well, the households have to take decisions too. Okay, but they can't invest and they can't decide about it. They have to decide, they can only hold debt claims. Okay. And because everything is driven by returns, we don't, so buying, the experts, they are essentially all the same. So buying from each other doesn't really do anything. That's about, I think, Sarah's question, or what was your name? Oh, Clara. Clara, yeah. Clara, okay. Um, okay, so, so essentially, and it turns out the, how many trees to plant, the investment rate, that's essentially a static problem. You can, so if you plant more trees, you produce trees and then you sell the trees at the price of the tree, you know? So you take a consumption, take an apple, plant them, so you cannot consume the apple, but you can sell then the tree at the price of the tree, which is Q, okay? Okay, so that's, uh, the return of, of, the, of the capital stock is just given, so what's the return of the capital stock? The return of the capital stock is that if I have a tree, I can, get apples out of that, that's nice, but some of the apples I have to plant, I plant them. So some of the apples I can eat, that's nice. The ones I plant, I cannot eat, that's not so nice. So I get the uh, A times K is the number of apples I get, minus Iota times K is essentially what I plant, that's what I can eat, divided by the price, that's my dividend yield, okay? That's the yield in terms of what I can actually act as consumption out of this. But it could also be that the values, once I have these trees and this capital, the value of the trees increase or go down. That's the capital gains and capital losses, okay? So what are these capital gains and capital losses? So that's essentially uh, the change of Q times K in percentage terms. So, but what, what, what do you see here? You see Q times K, what comes to your mind? Q times K. Q is a stochastic process we just postulated, and K is a stochastic process. What comes to your mind? E to product rule, no? Then you just, or what do you say? Okay, Q times K. So how does K, what's the drift of K? That's essentially the, that's how, when you plant new trees, that's the drifting up, and then it's depreciation. That's the drift of K, plus the drift of Q is this, okay? So that's the drift of that. And what is this term here? Why is there this term here? That's a covariance, the Ito term, how famous Ito term. That's the covariance thing. How does the K, which is shocked by the sigma, is loading on the Brownian, and the Q is loading on this Brownian too, okay? So that's the thing. And now, of this problem is very trivial, so you just take the first order condition with respect to Iota, and then you get uh, Tobin's Q equation. That's you get the most. What, uh, so all, all agents do the same thing. So they're all, uh, and hence this also holds for the aggregate equation. So you can solve for this iota without a superscript i uh, for any real agent. And what we typically do, and that's I think uh, Yuli came up with this formulation at some point to have this particular phi function which so the literature typically does a quadratic, but this log specification is, uh, is much more elegant uh, in a sense that you have this log specification. So this is a, this is a concave function here. And if you take this log specification, then you get this nice formula here that the adjustment cost, so you can think of this phi as the adjustment cost uh, is just times the investment rate is just Q minus one. And this is Tobin's Q, okay. okay. So then, and uh, we can also put the goods market clearing condition, so that's our goods market clearing condition, where what you can actually 
A times K is the total number of apples, iota times K you plant, so that's, that's the amount you can consume, that's the consumption of the experts and consumption of the households. Okay. <coughs> I'm a little confused about um, how to think of AI. It seems like some kind of, I guess, marginal return from your asset, but it doesn't seem to depend on, I guess, how much you're investing. That's correct. So it's an AK model, so it's a linear production function. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. So I actually, this, so I put this I there, but it's only for later, essentially, because only the experts and they're all identical. They have the same. Uh -huh. The households have an AI of, of much lower. They don't hold capital. But it does no curvature. All the curvatures can make the big speed. That's correct. Okay. Yes, but you could, yeah, so later we can put, put some curvature in. Okay. But for now it's uh, not there. Uh, now the next choice is a portfolio choice. Okay, so that's, uh, and that's also when we get to this question why the price of risk is uh, was sigma. So that's, that's our problem. So you see, so more generally, I put here, there could be some labor income and endowment, we don't have that. But essentially your net worth is just, the change in net worth, if you consume something, net worth is going down, that's drifting down, and then you get the portfolio share is theta, for each asset theta, times the return you get on this asset J. Okay, so there might be different assets J. Right now, we have only the risk-free bonds, so it's much simpler. But there's a portfolio share, and the marginal approach essentially says that and I'm only stating it here, uh, so I should have probably derived it from discrete time. So if you take the class, you probably saw it yesterday, how you derived this from discrete time, is that the stochastic discount factor times the value process of a self-financing trading strategy follows a martingale, okay? And, uh, And probably Yuli is going into that or not? So that's typically the case, and that's a dividend. And let's suppose we look at a self-financing trading strategy. Let's suppose it's IBM shares. And I look at the mutual fund, whenever IBM pays a dividend, the mutual fund is buying new IBM shares, okay? So the mutual fund itself doesn't pay any dividends because it just takes all the dividends payments from IBM and buys new, more IBM shares. So I can, and, and I price now, the mutual fund, and once I know the price of the mutual fund, I can really back out on the price of the IBMs again, okay? So I don't have that. And then you see this follows a martingale, no? Then I don't need these brackets either. Then this, this thing follows a martingale. You know this asset pricing formula? That's the standard Euler equation. And, and this follows a martingale. That's essentially what, what this says. Okay. So this is the big key formula. That's the key. That's the most important formula. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's so simple in a sense. Or what it means in a sense that the drift, if in continuous time the drift is zero. Okay, that's all what you need uh, to know. Um, and so the value of this IBM mutual fund follows a certain drift and it also loads on this Brownian. So it could be any asset or any self-financed trading strategy. And uh, we have said already, uh, the SDF follows this and I plug in for the drift minus R and for the volatility load minus VAR sigma. And you might say, oh, why VAR sigma? I just, for now it's only a label, okay? And then I use this E2 product rule and, and I know that this follows a martingale, so I have a stochastic process for the SDF, which is this guy here, and a stochastic process for the value of this portfolio A, or any asset A, which is self-financing, and I can use just the Ito product rule, I get this drift here, and then I get some volatility terms. But the Martingale theorem is that only says uh, that, that this thing has to be zero, okay? So which is, 
the drift of this guy, which is minus r, plus the drift of this guy, that is plus mu a, and I have the eta term, which is just the product of these two volatility loadings, that's this, and that's this minus sign, comes also here. Okay? And that has to be zero. So the expected, so the drift of this acid A, the expected return of this acid A, so the drift here, that's a standard Brownian with a mean zero. The drift of this acid A is this return of the SDF, the drift of the SDF minus plus was sigma sigma A. Okay? Just taking this. Now if I say what is the risk free aid, saying okay, you have a, a is a risk free asset, then there is no volatility loading, so risk free asset doesn't have that. So it looks like this. So saying okay, the risk free rate is Rj. That's what I just said earlier. We know from discrete time, same thing. Now if you say what if I take an asset A and an asset B, uh, then I can ju just take the difference, so I have this whole thing for A and I have the whole thing for B and take the difference, so the risk free rate drops out and I get this thing here. Okay, so if an asset A has more risk than asset B, then it has also a high expected return. And that now you see the price of risk shining through. Uh, and let's suppose asset B is a risk free rate, then this would be zero. Then it would be just saying, okay, the expected return of asset A minus the expected rate of the risk-free asset, that's like the risk-free rate, is equal to this var sigma times the risk of asset A. So that's the excess return, expected excess return, is the price of risk times the volatility of this asset A. Okay. And I think Yuli will explain it much better uh, than I did. So that's essentially how you do the portfolio choice. Then you apply it to the to our setting. So what's the expected return of our asset A, or our asset K, our trees, our production, is the dividend yield and this capital gains process we have just derived before, minus the other asset, which is, so if you're an expert, you think about the machines or the trees relative to the debt interest rate. Okay, these are the only two assets. Uh, so the expected excess return has to be the price of risk of these uh, experts times the risk of this asset. What is the risk of these trees or these machines? It's the sigma risk. It's the risk of this QK. There's risk coming from, from this K being shocked. That's exogenous risk. And then there's also the risk that the price moves around. That's this guy here. That comes also from the Ito product rule, just the volatility, which is sum of the two risk. And so that's it. Okay, and you see how, how all the terms drop out and simplify. Everything is very elegant. Okay. And then we have, we have already put in a goods market clearing condition. We have the capital markets clearing condition. So we have 1 minus theta e. So theta e is uh, what is, is invested in that. So that has to be the value of all the machines divided by the net worth. That has to be equal to the portfolio share you put into physical capital. Theta E is the portfolio share you put into the debt. Okay, these guys go short debt, so theta E can be negative. No. Okay. And the debt on the bond market or this debt claim market uh, clears by Walras law. Okay, that's it. And uh, so that's that that solves uh, this thing here. But of course, I've postulated this C process. No, you don't know yet what it is and how it moves around. Okay, I just gave you, there's now some sigma Q. I postulate a C process, SDF process, and a Q process. It's just floating around there. I have to fix that. Now, what I do next is I, as evolution of this well share of the experts. Okay, that's the eta. And the K evolution, essentially I have two state variables. I have the eta and the K, but the K is pretty boring. Once I know the iota, I know the K evolution, okay? Because the volatility is exogenous and the drift is determined by iota. Uh, once I know the investment rate, I know the growth rate of K. Okay, so that's pretty boring, it's not complicated. The complicated thing is my wealth share. And so essentially what, what we do is we say, okay, the whole state variable 
is eta, it characterizes the whole thing. So typically we have a history of shocks, and that leads to uh, then a hi to a history of, uh, of, of current prices, the price of risk, so price of capital, price of risk, the investment rate, portfolio choice, and all these things. But all what matters is essentially the, the net worth share, and that these are all are functions of then the current net worth share. So it's this Markovian structure. Okay? And so we have essentially the net worth of these experts divided by the total wealth in the economy. That's what our net worth share is. And then the agents maximize utility da, 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 in order to get the equilibrium. Okay, so the question is how do I get the evolution of this wealth share? And I know the evolution of the net worth. Okay? I know the evolution of this and this, but then I want the evolution of this net worth share. How do I do that? If I know the evolution of Q, I know the evolution of K, and I know the evolution of N, how do I get the evolution of the net worth share? Yes, exactly. So that's one way uh, to do that. So the evolution of net worth you know, of all the experts is the same. The percentage term is all of the individual net worth. So it's consumption, your net worth goes down. You get some risk-free rate uh, return in general. And then you get excessive risk-free rate on the excess expected. That's a risky rate on your capital stock minus the risk-free rate. That's excess rate you get on the capital. That's a portfolio share put together. That's your net worth. A share. And then we have to apply two things. So we know the evolution of N. We have to, the evolution of Q times K, we have to use product rule. We did this before. Uh, so the, then we get this thing here. And then we use the Ito ratio rule to get essentially divide and this guy divided by this guy. Okay? And then you get the evolution of the eta. Okay? And this requires a lot of algebra, even though at the end it turns out to be nice and elegant. Um, and there's another method to do this. I don't go into that. The Yuli will do that. Uh, OK, so that's that. And then there's this value functions. We have to then do everything value functions going back to get the price of risk and all that. And given my time constraints, I'll just give you the, we only focus on log utility. And typically, what we have is constant relative risk aversion utility function, also Epstein Sin utility functions. Uh, you have a value function which depends on your own net worth. And this is our economy wide things on the wealth share of the experts, the economy wide thing, and the total capital stock. Total capital stock is always, you know, follows very simple. I can take this out, so I essentially have to focus on these things. Okay. And the nice thing about constant relative risk aversion is, like of this form, is that the consumption net worth ratio is invariant of your net worth. So somebody who is 10 times as wealthy as me consumes, always, and he has the same sequence of shocks, consumes always 10 times as much as me. Okay. So this ratio is not moving around. Okay. Now that this feature uh, allows me uh, to postulate a value function which takes this form. So guess such a value function. And because of this uh, consumption net worth invariance, that the net worth times some investment opportunity or net worth multiplier. Okay? And you probably have this, heard this investment opportunity thing. That's this omega i. That's a function of this. This omega i is a function of these two state variables. Of course, the k we, we, we will can deal very easily. So it's really omega as function of eta. Okay, so that's uh, the net worth multiplier. So that's what I we can zoom in uh, to, to figure this thing out. Now, but what what we do is you can manipulate that. What you get the consumption net worth ratio is given by this, and all what I want to say if the risk aversion coefficient is one, then this is to the the net worth multiplier or this uh, investment opportunity is to the power of zero, that so this is always one. And this is also one. So the net worth, uh, the consumption net worth ratio is always rho. Okay? Or put it differently, how much you consume is you take your wealth times rho, that's what you consume. And that's very simple, very, you know, can't get simpler than that. 
You take the total wealth, you anticipate everything, and you consume a fraction raw of it. Okay. Of course, the raw can be different from person to person, and that's uh, things. Um, okay, so that's essentially for log utility, everything becomes very simple. So the two things which come out of it is the consumption is just rho times net worth for log utility. And the portfolio choice is essentially a myopic portfolio choice. So typically when you do portfolio choice, there's a myopic component and then there's a dynamic hedging component to that. So this dynamic hedging is due to Mertens or the Mertonian dynamic hedging component. And for log, this goes away. Okay. What's the intuition that regardless of how much risk there's in the uh, economy that you're still consuming the same amount of your, of your wealth? Yeah, so there are two components. One is, you know, there's an income and substitution effect and they both uh, cancel out. Uh, I, I wouldn't, so regardless for how much risk is there in the economy, it, holding net worth fixed, okay? But the net worth, of course, will, if the risk is higher, the net worth will be different too. Okay, so there is a precautionary, so you're saying, oh, there's no precautionary saving, but the, the net worth itself is changing. Okay, so if there's more risk in the system, the risk premium you make and all this will be different, so the net worth will not be the same, uh, in essence. So, the, so it's, it's only holding net worth to incorporate a static with net worth, which is an endogenous uh, animal. And the, so the one thing is uh, why this log utility, why there are, so there's income and substitution effect is canceling out, and why this is myopic. Uh, so I have to explain more this Mertonian hedging demand uh, feature. But typically, what, what's going on is that the same If I take on my portfolio now, if I take on more risk, it could be that I make a loss, but it could be subs when I make a make a loss, my value function going forward subsequently, I have an investment opportunity is improving a lot. So I'm naturally hedged. Okay? So if, whenever I make a payoff loss, I get a better investment opportunity. And this gives me a natural hedge. And given that I have this natural hedge, I can actually take on more risk today because there's, uh, this investment opportunity is moving in the other direction. Okay? And the question is, how much can you take this on this investment if you become poorer and you feel very risk averse that I, I become poorer, I can't really take on this opportunity, then you don't like that. If you have a, a risk aversion where you think, oh, when this negative shock happens, I can really take on this additional opportunity, then you don't mind taking on this risk because if it goes down, you get the better opportunity. So you lose, but you gain benefit. And so it depends on the risk aversion which way this effect goes. And if gamma is one, the two effects cancel out. Okay. And okay. So you, we put all the output clearing, so the output goods market clearing condition, we had this already beforehand. Uh, what's special about this Barsa Coco model is that, uh, so we put this in total consumption is this, it's, it's A minus I investment rate, that's essentially uh, the goods market clearing condition. What is total consumption? We just see it's rho times the net worth. So it's for both groups, the total net worth in the whole economy is Q times K, you know, times rho, that's the total consumption. And that's A minus iota, which depends on the price of the capital. If the price of capital is higher, you plant more trees, you know, because you can sell it at a higher price. And what, what jumps at you when you look at this? You can divide through this k. What jumps at you? What, did, what does jump at you? It jumps at you that this q, it's not moving as the, I shock this k. No? So the q is constant. Now, everything becomes extremely simple. Uh, there's no drift in q. There's no volatility loading in q. So I postulate an, a q process. But once I, put, I see that, I noticed, ah, oh, this is an E2 process, but it's a constant. It's a very simple E2 process, okay? So, and then this Q is constant. I can just calculate the investment rate, too, from this constant Q. And so I just use this capital market clearing condition, which this is just, if you look at it, N divided by this was our well share of the experts. And this is 1 over iota. And then I can solve for the whole thing. And you can solve. 
for this Q, that's, that's the constant Q. You can solve for the return. All these terms, because that's zero, that's zero, that's zero, becomes all much simpler. You can solve for the risk-free rate. That becomes your risk-free rate. It's a time reference rate. Depends on this adjustment cost functions, depreciation. So that's the growth rate of the economy. So typically, you know, when the economy grows faster, the risk-free rate is higher. No? That's the Ramsey term in, in the risk-free rate term. And then there's the precautionary savings term, is this guy here. No? So the risk-free rate, so if, if there's more risk in the economy, people want to save uh, more for that. So that's, that shows up here. And then you can also get the evolution of eta. How is eta evolving over time? That's the wealth share of these experts. And so that's drifting somewhere. So well, what do you see here? If you look at this, do you see something here? Positive drift. Yes, so it's a positive drift, and it's always positive. So what does this mean? In the long run, the experts take over. So you have these guys, these productive guys, the borrow from the households. The households get some interest payment at this risk-free rate all the time. And they enjoy the risk-free rate. But over time, the wealth share of the households gets smaller and smaller. Or the wealth share of the experts becomes, uh, so in the long run, there's positive drift. Um, of course, there's a volatility on it. But in, in the long run, the, the experts have 100% of the wealth in the economy. Okay. It's not a really interesting model where one group takes over. I mean, could be, but... Uh, um, so and that's in a lot of macrofinance models, and like Akira Takimura and BGG and all of these models, uh, there's the problem that the more productive guys take over okay, the whole economy in the long run. So what do you do? Exactly, dying. Death is the solution. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's only one solution. Uh, another solution is you make them switch. You know, some guys lose their expertise, switching back and forth. And a third solution, which is often used also, is that you make the experts less patient. Okay. So in a sense that the experts, the consume at a faster rate. So they don't become wealthier because they just eat it up at a faster rate than the households. Okay? So that's something we have to fix. And um, yeah. And the other thing is what's strange in this economy is that so it's very natural. So let me. So here is just a numerical thing. The Q is fixed. The risk-free rate is going, so if eta goes down, the risk-free rate is lower. The drift is always positive. So why is it the case when, when, uh, when eta is very low, the drift is very high? So when the experts are very poor, they, are, they make a lot of... Uh, well, when the experts are really poor, they will find a lot of compensation. So Exactly. So they get a huge risk premium because they have to, they're the only ones who hold the machines in this economy. So they need a lot of risk premium to do that. And hence, they earn a lot of risk premium, so they grow out of it. The, the, the drift rate is the wealth share is growing out very fast. So that's this thing here. And you can see, but the volatility is, so they, ha they have to hold a lot of risk. And the wealth share is also very volatile. Okay. Now, when they're wealthy, then the wealth share is not so volatile. You don't have to give them so much risk premium either. But what drives essentially the thing is the risk premium. Now, what does it, but a risk premium, how can there be a risk premium if the price of the machine is constant? Where does the risk premium come from? Second? Exogenous. K, I mean, K is not taught as the IOT is endogenous, but the risk premium, what it comes from, is just the risk free rate goes to very low. Okay? So the return on producing, a, so the price of a tree is Q. It produces a certain number of apples, A times K. Um, so the price is fixed. So where it really comes from, the risk premium, is just the risk free rate is, is very low. 
or put it differently, what the households get from, from lending to the, to the experts is a very low risk-free rate. Okay. So they get a high uh, risk-free rate if, if, the, if, the, if the experts are wealthy, but if the experts are very poor, the, risk rate goes, the real risk-free rate goes really negative. Okay. Okay, you can say, oh, zero lower bound and things like that. We don't have anything like that. Okay, so there are some papers. Alp Simzik has a recent paper, and let's put the zero lower bound on there. Then it doesn't work anymore. Then the model goes ballistic. Okay, but without zero lower bound, you have to really end this model because Q is fixed. It doesn't move much. It has everything has to be done through the risk free rate. Okay. Or put it differently, uh, so eta fluctuates with the macro shocks since the experts are levered. And the sharp ratio, that's the sharp ratio, no? the expected excess return. That's the drift in Q times K. And, and that's the risk free rate divided by the volatility. That's the sharp ratio. As eta goes to zero, this goes actually, uh, uh, goes to infinity as, as eta goes to zero. Okay? And so that's essentially what, what happens if eta goes to zero. These experts have almost no, they have to hold a lot of risk. They're the only ones who can hold this risk. You have to give them a lot of sharp ratio. Okay. And the way to achieve that is if eta goes to zero, uh, this term blows up, so the, the risk free rate goes to in minus infinity. Okay. But there's no endogenous risk. Sig sigma q, I was after the endogenous risk. I spent too much time on it. Uh, um, there's no amplification, there are no volatility effects. And the drift is positive. We grow out determini I mean, not deterministically, but in the long run, the households die out essentially. And, and that's what we talked already about, the different ways to deal with this in the macrofinance literature. Now, I didn't really teach you the desired properties. I want to have some around the stable, st uh, there's a stochastic steady state. And around the steady state, the regime is normal. So the experts are well capitalized, and they absorb the macro shocks. But once we get away from it, there's non-linearity. And then it suddenly the system becomes much more dramatic. Uh, we don't have this. We, we, haven't, we don't have any endogenous risk. The price of risk is also boring. There are no fire cells. There are no liquidity, liquidity spirals, no fat tails. I wanted to catch some fat tails, spillovers. And you know, SDF is moving around significantly, volatility paradox. Uh, and all of these things are not there. Okay. But it was already an interesting model, no? Um, so my plan was to spend the second part, but I'm running out of time, uh, on, on this type of model where now we have this risk premium and the price of risk and endogenous risk is moving around. So, so far the endogenous risk was zero uh, through amplification or even when there are jumps, multiple equilibria jump uh, to take this into account and take these nonlinearities into account. And that's what the next part uh, is all about and essentially get to this picture which I alluded to initially. And, uh, and that's the next, that's the baseline model, essentially. Let me just how you enrich the baseline model. The baseline model essentially is saying, now we have still experts and households. And the experts, they are better in producing things. But the households can also produce something. So they are actually also can produce things, but they're not so good at it. Okay. But this allows me fire cells. Now the households say, oh, if you really can't hold anymore, you want this huge risk premium, fire sell your capital, your trees, to the households. Okay? So now the households can also hold some of the capital. So this allows for these fire cells. Okay? So the households can, what happens in equilibrium then is if the experts are really undercapitalized, there was a sequence of bad shocks. The eta is going down, the wealth share is going down. Then the households will, but the experts will fire sell the, the trees to the less productive households. Okay. And the houses say, okay, I will hold it, I produce it a less productive way. I don't pay much for these trees, but I'm hoping that the economy recovers and then we, we sell it back later on. They're speculating essentially. Okay. They say, well, I'm not good in managing these uh, trees, but I hold it because it's so, so depressed, I step in and the fire sale is, is going on. 
Is a fire sale a good thing or a bad thing? Is it, is it good that these guys can step in? So now you take it away from the productive guy. So you take it away from the productive guy and give it to the less productive guy. It's a bad thing, no? This, if, I would, if I would not allow fire sales, I just force the experts to hold on to it, then they will produce at a higher productivity rate. The fact that they can fire sell is, is actually a bad thing, isn't it? Uh, you would say, yes, that's a bad thing. But knowing that expert knows if things go wrong, I can pass it on to the households. He might say, I'm more willing ex ante to level up more. That might be a good thing to scale up the whole economy. Okay? So whether allowing fire cells or not, you need a model like this if you do welfare analysis. Okay? So that's one thing is this fire cell. The other thing is you can allow outside equity, so you can sell off some of the risk, but what we assume, we can sell off some of the risk, but not all of it. Okay? You can sell off, let's say, 60% of the risk. And 40% of the risk the experts have to hold. If you can sell off 100% of the risk, then you're back to reserve agent, you know, no incumbent markets. But if you can sell off only 60% of the risk, then the whole dynamic still works as before. Okay? But it, it amplifies less. The more outside equity you can sell off, the less it amplifies. And then and now the picture looks like this. No? I can sell off some, but not all of that. And let me just highlight the differences, and I will just set up the model and give you the results. Uh, now we have the experts and the households. They can also produce, but the experts have a higher productivity than the households. Okay. The other thing is I do is that I, I don't want that the experts take over the economy and the households die out. So there are different tricks, and you prefer the death. I'm, death is a little bit harsh. So <laughs> I make the experts uh, consume at a higher rate. Okay, and then we also allow this uh, this outside equity uh, uh, dimension. Now, if you do this, then we go through all these five steps again. Okay, and here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so typically, actually, a very nice formula is if you look at if you look at this, the total volatility is the exogenous volatility and the endogenous volatility. Is, is the initial volatility divided by this, and you can see a liquidity spiral. Can you see it? If you take an infinite sum of a geometric series, uh, it's always one, uh, the first element divided by one minus something. And that is it's the same flavor here. And it depends how sensitive the price is to this well share. Uh, that's a price elasticity. And that's a leverage ratio. So you get very nice formulas in this continuous time setting. Okay? But I didn't have time. I was planning to derive it. Um, but then you go through that, and then what you see is that you see now the price of Q is not constant anymore, so over eta. Actually, it is first when the experts have 100% of the machines or of these trees, it's actually downward sloping. That's because of these different rows. But then you get in a crisis region, so it's occasionally binding skin in the game constraint. Uh, then you get in this crisis region, and then the Q drops dramatically, okay? because these guys, and they start fire selling. And you also see the volatility of Q. The volatility of Q is, is not very high, but when you get in the crisis region, it explodes. Okay? And you can, I mean, you can explicitly drive that. You can do a lot of. Uh, comparative statics, I don't have time for that. Um, yeah, and then you can also look at the stage, how does the system behave, how does the state variable itself move? So that's our eta. And there are different regimes. I mentioned already there's the crisis regime, and then there's this intermediate regime, and then there's the other regime. But you see that there's the drift is negative. So you drift back slowly here. If you are in here, you drift out of it. And, and you see the volatility of eta itself, no? that well share volatility. And so it's, if you're here, essentially there is, there's no volatility of the well share. Well share is just drifting deterministically. It's drifting deterministically back. There's no volatility. Here it jumps around a lot, and it drifts up. Okay. So that's how 
the situation looks. And from this, you can derive some stationary distribution using Andre's favorite, the Kolmogorov forward equation. OK, let me uh, conclude with that. Uh, sorry, I ran over. You can do some you know, fancy fan charts, uh, not just uh, impulse response curves. And you can solve for these desired model properties I talked earlier. So perhaps one minute for an extra question before we go to the break, coffee break. Uh, any question? Or oh, coffee is favorite. favorite. <laughs> OK, thanks a lot. Uh, I see you then in 20 minutes. Uh, enjoy the coffee break. Talk to you soon.